Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Now I know we might feel a, a wee bit relaxed and I'll start to be like, I'm going to do a talk in a wee minute after that. But Amanda gave an excellent presentation and I'm going to follow on just a wee bit more from that and talk about stress and the whole mind-body connection. But we're going to really um, get to the nitty gritty here about really what's going on with stress. Now today I'm going to talk about taking a holistic approach to overcoming fatigue and every other symptom under the sun. Now what I really hope to achieve by giving this presentation is really shifting our um, current thinking away from treating symptoms and really getting to the underlying cause of why a person is fatigued and why a person has symptoms. Because the current kind of medical model and our healthcare model at the moment is really focused on treating the symptom that has the person and never really treating the person that has the symptom. And I'm going to show you why in a wee minute that we need to get rid of this thinking and really start treating the person that has the symptoms and working with the underlying cause of why a person is dysfunctional and why they're ill. Now before we do that, I'm going to talk to you just a wee bit more about who I am, what I do and how I came to be doing what I'm doing just now. My name's Dean Fraser, for those of you who don't know me. Um, some people might know me as Coach Fraser from my Facebook page and my website. I'm a health and exercise coach based in Edinburgh. I'm also the founder of Coach Fraser's Functional Wellbeing, which is a blog I'll um, we'll share with you after this. And I really, I've been in this industry for about several years now. And I started off working as just a basic fitness instructor in a local gym in Edinburgh. And at that point, all I really had was a level two gym instructing qualification. I had my basic personal training qualification. And I had to be on what we call the register of exercise professionals here in order for you to have insurance and be able to work in the industry. Now this requires you to have um, continuous knowledge and CPT points and stuff like that. So you have to take quite a lot of courses in order to stay on here if you want to work. So a lot of courses I did were like kettlebell instructing, Olympic weightlifting, I did a lot of massage work, I got a diploma in um, sports massage, I did a lot of strength and conditioning work with the UKSCA as well. Um, but I always kind of felt there was really something missing. Like there's another piece of the puzzle I just wasn't quite getting, I wasn't learning. Because I was working with people on a day-to-day -day basis who were coming to the gym and I was seeing them every day and they had a lot of health complaints and it was really restricting them from doing some basic things and really restricting them from living a life that they really wanted to live as well. So I decided to advance my education a wee bit more and really search people who were doing amazing things and getting great results with their clients. And this led me to become a Czech practitioner under Paul Czech's Institute. And uh, Czech is just an acronym for Corrective Holistic Exercise Kinesio uh, Kinesiology. Sorry. And I also went on to study under Reed Davis to become a health practitioner in Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. It's quite a big title, and um, we'll get more into that in a wee bit. So, what this really did was it changed my whole perspective of how I viewed health. It changed my perspective on what I really thought symptoms were, and it changed um, the way that I really worked with clients. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to share with you my approach to health, what I do with people, and really try and shift our current way of thinking about what health actually is. Because that's what this whole event is, isn't it? It's the lateral health. We're going to take a new perspective on health. So let me just get straight into it. Let's have a new way of thinking about health and just take a, a look at this for a wee minute. Now I'm going to show you a diagram. I'm going to need a wee bit of participation from you. So if I ask any questions, feel free just to share out the answers. And if I'm starting to go too fast, just let me know and I will slow down. I tend to have a bad habit of um, just going on and on about the same topic. So I'll try and keep my notes here, keep myself um, on time as well. I don't want to do a Billy Connolly and talk for two hours about something and then come back to the main bit. <laughs> so can anybody tell me what that big organ in your skull which allows you to think is called? Brain. Yeah, excellent. It's good to see that some of us have one. Now your brain is connected to... What's connected to? What was Amanda talking about? The central nervous system, the body. The body, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, some of us have a brain and some of it's working. Now, how does the brain communicate with the body? Apart from everyone who's a scientist here, can anybody else um, shout out some answers? How does the brain communicate with the body? Nerves. Yeah, it communicates through the nerves. Anything else? Shout them out. Hormones. Hormones, right? Because we're going to get into that in a wee moment. So the brain's connected to the body. The body um, and the brain communicate with each other. What's the sole purpose of this communication? Why does it operate like this? To keep us well. To 
keep us well? Okay, that's the correct answer. I'll just make it a, a bit more, I'll simplify it a bit more. It's to do with function. And the whole reason it communicates is to make sure that the systems in the body are functioning. Your liver, your heart, your adrenal glands, all functioning at 100%. And when your body's functioning properly and the communication pathways are working well, then we have, we come into a state of ease. It just means your physiology is balanced out. And this is what health looks like. This is what a healthy person should look like. You should have a brain. It should uh, be connected with your body. It should communicate properly. Your bodily system should function well. Your hormonal system should function well. Your digestive system should function well. There shouldn't be any malfunction. And you should be in a state of ease. Now, a lot of people who get in contact with me and they want to work with me and they want to hire me as a health coach, uh, they don't look like this, believe me. They come to me with what we call symptoms. You know, they're fatigued, they're tired, they've got headaches, they've got heartburn, digestion, uh, you know, their farts smell rancid, their partner doesn't even want to be in the room with them half the time, so they kick them out of the bed to go and camp on the couch. I'm not talking from my own experience. Um, but we've got to look at why has this person got symptoms if their body's functioning properly? Why does this person have symptoms if they're healthy? Well, symptoms are really the last thing to appear when you have disease or when the function of um, your physiology is being disrupted and it's not balanced anymore. And disease comes from malfunction. When certain systems in the body just stop functioning, it takes your physiology out of a state of balance and disrupts it. And then disease um, symptoms start to appear. Now, what is the current way that we treat this? We always treat symptoms, and so how do we treat symptoms? We treat it with a pill half the time, you know. If you have this, then you've got to take that, so this for that approach, you know. There's, for every ill, there's a pill, you know. If you have a headache, you can take a paracetamol. If you've got some indigestion, there's a drug that you can take for that. And that's really our current way of thinking. But is it really addressing this malfunction here? No one's really addressing this. Everybody's addressing what symptoms are, and they're just chasing symptoms. And if you just chase symptoms, all you'll ever do is just chase symptoms. And sometimes um, symptoms can turn into a different system, symptoms and they can come back. And sometimes they can come back even harder than what they were. Uh, a classic example of how this all works really is, we'll take heartburn for instance. Now, what do most people do when they get heartburn? They take an antacid to help try and neutralize um, the acid that's in their esophagus there. But it doesn't really address the problem of why do you have heartburn. Now, if you're taking an antacid, what happens with most people when they take an antacid is heartburn co just comes back and it gets more frequent and the more antacids they have to take. And the more antacids they have to take, the more drugs they take, you tend to find that these type of people just have chronic heartburn all the time. Because all they're doing is just masking a symptom. They're not getting to the underlying cause. So if you have a headache, for instance, and you just take a paracetamol, it might take your headache away, but your headache is really still there. You're just numb to it, and you're just getting on with your day-to-day -day life. But the dysfunction is further deteriorating, and your health is going down. So a lot of people will take like antacids to try and neutralize the stomach acid in their esophagus to take away the symptom. Now, what's really going on here with the body, and why is it malfunctioning? Well, the bottom of your esophagus is a spinster that closes to stop stomach acid from getting up into your esophagus. And the body works on the all or nothing principle, meaning that when it has to work, it'll work. When it doesn't have to work, it's going to kick back and relax and reserve its energy for times that it does. Now, you don't have heartburn because you've got too much stomach acid that's getting into your esophagus. It doesn't really work like that. In fact, it's the opposite. You've probably got too little stomach acid if you have um, heartburn. And the reason for this is really, at the bottom of your esophagus, where that spinster is, it closes tight. Um, the higher your stomach acid is, then the more your body has to work to close that spinster to stop it getting up into your esophagus. The lower your stomach acid gets, then the less your body has to work because the threat of acid getting through into your esophagus isn't as much. So it relaxes and that spinster can open and you'll get wee bits of acid coming into your esophagus, which is why you're getting heartburn. Now, we take an antacid to neutralize the acid that's in our esophagus to take us away from our discomfort and our pain, then what happens when that gets to the stomach? It lowers your stomach acid even more, and this is why heartburn just keeps coming back, and sometimes it can get worse. So all we're doing is treating the symptom, but we're not really treating the malfunction of why it's happening, and this is really what I want to get into. Now, don't get me wrong, um, 
drugs are great. Um, it can take you out of your pain. It can take you away from discomfort. But that's just a bit of relief care. But you have to be looking at the malfunction at the same time. I mean, if I get somebody coming to me and they've got terrible headaches, and I'm like, well, I do lab testing, like, you know, let me to check your hormones. Two weeks later, I'll tell you some things you can do. This person doesn't want to do that. They're like, I just want to get my headache away. So the minute you take the headache away, you can start to talk to them about building health. Now let's get back to why the body's malfunctioning. What's going on here? Why is it not operating properly? Well, it's really to do with this idea of stress or distress. And Amanda was talking about this just a wee bit as well. Now let's just think about stress as anything that disrupts the physiology in your body and disrupts that balance. We can call that stress. And it comes in three forms. There's your mental, emotional. There's physical and biomechanical stress, and there's also chemical and biochemical stress. And it's the chemical biochemical stress that I really um, work on when I'm working with clients. I'm really looking at uh, how well the body's functioning. We'll do lab tests for like hormones, digestion, your immune function, how well your detoxification pathways in the body are working, you know, your liver, um, your gallbladder, your kidneys and stuff. And when we start to balance out the function of the body, and the body starts to function properly, we start to balance out the physiology of the body, which brings us into a state of ease or homeostasis. And then what you tend to find is symptoms just disappear. So you don't always have to treat symptoms. If you get the body functioning right, your symptoms will disappear. And sometimes they'll disappear for good. So what I'd like to also talk about is a wee bit more in detail about one of the key areas that I focus on when I'm working with clients and it's to do with the hormonal system um, because if your hormones are imbalanced and you've got issues with your hormonal system then you're never really going to achieve a proper state of health because it's going to have a cascade event on other um, functions of the body which are just going to further lead to dysfunction which you'll tend to find that symptoms will just come from everywhere and if you're only treating symptoms, you'll always be chasing symptoms. You'll never get to the underlying cause and you'll never be healthy. So let's talk a wee bit about hormones and hormone pathways. Now, for those of you who aren't scientists and nutritionists here, hormone really is just um, produced by a certain body part to go and tell another body part what to do. It's a chemical messenger that flows through your blood. On a really basic level, in a nutshell, that's what a hormone is. But hormones also contain building blocks that help to metabolize into different hormones as well. And this is called a hormonal pathway, and this is what we're really going to talk about. Now, you have a big hormone in your body called pregnenolone. I hope you do. Uh, God be with you if you don't, really, to be honest. Now, pregnenolone has got the building blocks to make what we call DGA, which um, through its metabolites go into your ultra-familiar sex hormones. We probably should all know what estrogen and uh, testosterone is. You'll all be familiar with that. Now, don't worry about getting caught up on the big names here. Um, let's just think about pregnenolone as we'll, we'll call that Dave, for those of you who are like nutritionists. And Dave's a builder. And Dave's got a wee toolkit and he can build things, whatever you want. You just send a message to Dave and Dave will go and build you some good sex hormones. <laughs> now you can think about this. <laughs> I wish there was that simple to be honest, you know, you, you go to a doctor and he just fills these things, but that doesn't really happen. Now, let's think about this pathway here as an anabolic pathway. Anabolic really meaning that it helps to repair you, it helps to build you up. Um, but there's also another pathway in your body, and it's being used in times of stress, and it's this pathway here, which is pregnenolone, progesterone to cortisol. And this is more your, uh, an, your catabolic pathway, which is more destructive and breaks things down. So on one hand, we have an anabolic pathway that builds you up. We have a catabolic pathway that builds you down. And when I'm working with clients, I'm really looking at these hormones and I'm looking at dynamics, but I'm really looking at cortisol to DHEA. And I'm trying to say, where are you in your balance and your physiology? Are you more um, catabolic up here and anabolic down here, or is it vice versa? Because when you tilt the scales, you're going to see in a wee minute that it's going to have such an impact on the rest of your body and you can develop symptoms um, which are very hard to pin down to exactly where they're coming from. Now, Dave, who is pregnant alone, has building blocks to make your sex hormones. He also has building blocks in the wee toolkit to build your stress hormones, cortisol over here as well. 
The problem really is when the signal, um, for whatever reason, tells Dave, which is you, your body, basically telling Dave or Prenetland, hey, go and make some stress hormones, um, starts to happen too often and it starts to be more the preferred pathway of your body, we get into what we call, yep, it's working, the pregnenolone steel, where basically you're having more pregnenolone going over to cortisol here than you do to make your sex hormone. So basically Dave is constantly using all his toolkit to build your um, stress hormones. So therefore he's starting to run out of materials to build your sex hormones. So what you tend to find on a patient's um, lab test when it comes back, if they're under quite a lot of stress, is their stress hormones are all the way up here. Their DHA is down here and their sex hormones are away at the bottom. Now when you have a deficiency within your sex hormones here, I mean some of the symptoms associated with like low testosterone or things like low libido, which is um, low sex drive, you'll get vaginal dryness, foggy thinking, um, you know, you're going to be fatigued, you're going to have sleep problems, and you tend to find that men who have low testosterone just seem to lose an interest in cars and really like shopping for some reason. <laughs> you know. So that's another system that, you know, another symptom that could arise. But like, in all seriousness, let, let's get back to what's really going on here. Estrogens. Your estrogens as well. What happens when uh, you have low estrogen? What are some of the symptoms that are associated with a deficiency of estrogen? You know, um, you're going to have hot flashes, <coughs> night sweats, uh, tearful, depression, and incontinence, and the list, it just goes on and on. Now this is just a, an imbalance in one area of your body. You know, you've got like um, a deficiency in just like one pathway. And so far you can see that there's all these symptoms which are starting to appear which are associated with that. And that's just a deficiency. Now let's look at the other side of the scale. We have elevated um, stress hormones. What can that do to your body? Well, elevated levels of cortisol has been shown to suppress gut function. And when you suppress gut function and you start to close down how well your gut's functioning, you can, that leads, well, it just opens a door to Pandora's box, to be honest. But it can lead to things like um, a dysbiosis, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in your gut and that can lead to things like leaky gut syndrome and when you've got leaky gut syndrome that just really means that the junction within the intestinal wall that's supposed to stop certain food particles getting through breaks down and opens up and it allows these food particles to get through. That can trigger your immune system to have a really big response which starts to attack these um, food particles that are in your body that shouldn't be there which leaves you more susceptible to like colds, viruses and illnesses. Now when these food particles also get through these tight junctions, they'll travel through what you call your hepatic portal vein up into your liver, it can toxify your liver, overwork your liver, burden your liver, and your liver can get congested. Now when your liver gets congested, it starts to spill bile acids back into the blood, that's going to cause a hard time for your kidneys as well because they're going to have to work over time to try and filter that through into your urine, so you tend to find your pain more often. And the amount of symptoms associated with gut dysfunction and liver dysfunction, there's hundreds. There's, I mean, there's far too many for me to really list in this um, small talk for like 20 minutes or something I'm talking for, which I'll probably talk a lot more. <laughs> but I hope you, this is starting to hit home that, you know, if you've got dysfunction in your body, then symptoms, how do you say, okay, you have a headache, take this pill, uh, and you'll be fine. Now you really want to be fine, but you really need to look at the underlying cause of what's going on. So we just mask our symptoms, and we just forget about the person's health and how well that person's doing, what their what their lifestyle looks like. Then it's just going to further deteriorate, and we're not really doing any help for that person. Like you know, we're not doing anything at all. We're not teaching them what health is. We're not teaching them how to get healthy, how to sustain that health, what's really going on with their body, how to make the right choices in life to balance these things out so they can live a really decent life. Now what I'd like to also talk about, now don't get me wrong, because cortisol seems like it's got a bad rep because it does all these things. There's no such thing as a bad hormone, it's just to do a balance in the body and how well it's functioning. We need certain levels of cortisol throughout the day um, to do certain things. Like Amanda was talking, you have that 
fight or flight response in your body. When you get a fight or flight response in your body, that's basically your cortisol going up and it's starting to liberate your adrenaline as well. So that's why your heart rate's going up. You're like, oh, I've got to fight this tiger here. But then your brain's like, don't fight the tiger. That's stupid. Run, 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 you know? Um, and you need energy to do that. But I mean, if, you, if you've just done me meditation, you're like, oh, man, I'm going to walk away from this tiger. Things will be fine. You know, you're going to die. So. <laughs> Uh, so you need, your body in times of stress needs to give you that kick up the rear side in order for you to have that energy to go and do things which are necessary and that's a survival mechanism. And we need certain amounts of cortisol in our body just in case a stressful situation occurs so we can adapt to it. Um, but it's also natural anti-inflammatory. So if you're eating um, foods for instance, which you have sensitivities to and you're getting a lot of inflammation, your body will produce cortisol to fight that. Now I don't know if anybody's been on holiday somewhere um, hot and they've been bitten by a mosquito during the day. You'll tend to find that it's only at night time that it really starts to itch and you're like, oh my god man, I'm taking half my arm off to scratch this. That's because um, your cortisol at night time will dip down to allow you to sleep because if you have ele elevated levels of stress hormones on your body then good luck trying to get a good night's sleep. You know, you're going to be sitting awake the whole time like, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. And it's to do with that fight or fight mode again. Now let's talk about what we can actually do to balance out um, the physiology of our body and what we can do to restore function so we don't have to keep taking drugs, we don't have to keep going to doctors, we don't have to expend excess amounts of money on health professionals. Um, we can really start to take care of ourselves because health is really all about taking responsibility for yourself and it's really all about educating yourself on what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now this is really the holistic approach to being fatigued or overcoming any other symptom that you can think about. We need to optimize um, these areas of our life. We need to optimize movement, diet, rest, and mindset. Now the thing with this is, they're all interconnected. You can't just focus on your diet and not focus on movement and rest. And you can't neglect your diet and think, if I just do exercise, I'll be fine. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Now you can look at it this way. If you have a poor diet, you're probably going to have like some dysregulation of your blood sugar, which means you're not really going to get a, a decent night's sleep. It's not going to be a restful sleep. You don't get a restful sleep. You wake up in the morning, you're tired, you're wired, you're drained of energy, you're in a bad mood, you're grumpy, and people don't like being around you. It's probably going to set you up for a negative mindset. You've got a negative mindset and you don't have that much energy. You're going to go, I don't want to go to the gym. I can't be bothered exercising. I'm not in the mood today you don't go to the gym or you don't do any forms of movement, then you know, you're, you're not going to have really good um, energy levels. You're probably going to make bad dietary choices and the circle goes on and on and on. You can look at this another way. You have a good diet, good food coming in. You're going to have natural energy. You're going to feel like you want to burn that energy off. You go to the gym, you work out, you elevate really good um, hormones that make you feel good. You've got good self-esteem. You're in a better mindset. And people like being around you, and you can socialize better with people, you can articulate well, and you're going to want to sleep better as well because you've been moving and you've been optimizing your diet. You get a good night's sleep, you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like you have to drag yourself out of bed just to get to the, the coffee pot to give you energy to go to work, you know. You go, like, yeah, I'm going to work today, I feel great. You know, after work I'm going to hit the gym, you're going to blast the gym, you do a good workout, like, man, I need to go and get some food and I'm going to go and sleep afterwards. You know, and you get a better quality of life. And when you have a better quality of life, you're a better human being to be around. When you're a better human being to be around, you start to influence people. People be like, oh, I want that energy. I want to be just like that person. And we can make a better world for ourselves. Because at the end of the day, this journey is not about me. It's not about you. It's about us together and what we can do to make a better environment to live in. And this is why being healthy is really, is really critical. So if you're neglecting your health, you're also <coughs> neglecting the health of others around you as well because you should be a shining example of um, how to live. Because when other people see you, when you're living good, people want to mimic that, they want to emulate that, they want to be good, they want energy, and they want to be healthy. So before I finish here, what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to give you some things you can take away and implement into your own life. What I don't want you to do is be like, yeah, yeah, what he was saying about, you know, we shouldn't be treating symptoms, we should get into the underlying cause, that's great. And then be like, well, how do I do that? What do I do? You know, you're, we're talking about movement here. And we're talking about diet, best, and mindset. I'd better check my time, because I know you're all hungry, and I'm starting to get hungry, so. Right, so, movement. 
how do we use that to balance out our hormone levels? How do we use that to get away from a catabolic state more into an anabolic state? If we're too anabolic, how do we bring it down and be a bit more catabolic to balance ourselves out? Well, I'd like to share this concept of working out versus working in. Now, in working out, really, all working out is, is you just expand the energy you have inside of your body out of you. And when you do a good workout, you're like, I'm going to go and sit down and I'm going to eat some protein and I'm going to feel better after that. And that's when you know you've had a good workout. Working in is the opposite. Working in is when you try and bring energy into the body. So you finish your workout routine and you finish your working routine with more energy than when you started. There are certain types of activity to do this. You can do like yoga, you can do Tai Chi. You can really take any exercise and you can use it as a working exercise if you stick with the principle, basically, you don't want to elevate your heart rate. Because when you elevate your heart rate, then um, you, know, you start to release a lot of stress hormones when you're doing a workout. And that basically takes your blood away from the visual area into your extremities. And puts you in that fight or flight mode uh, that we were talking about earlier. Because, I mean, if you have to run away from a lion, for instance, or if you have to do a deadlift and you have to pick 200 kilograms up from the ground, you, know, you don't want your blood at the visual area. You want your blood in your extremities to move that way or in order to run. Now, a working is different. A working is when you start to use the extremities of your body to pump blood back into your visual system because you're not getting your heart rate up. And this can help with things like digestion. A great example of this is if you've ever had um, a heavy meal, for instance, and you're like, oh, I feel quite tired, I've eaten too much, but you go for a walk. And after your walk, you're like, I feel, I feel great, I don't feel heavy anymore. It's because when you're walking, there's a form of working in exercise. You know, you're not elevating your heart rate, you're just walking, you're using your extremities to pump blood back to the visceral area, which is helping you to digest food. So you can do things like yoga and tai chi, and you can go for walks and stuff like that. And the idea really is, it depends where you are on this journey of health. You know, if you're in really good health, you'll probably benefit from a really good workout. You know, you'll be able to go to the gym and blast it, get a good workout, and afterwards it's going to have an anabolic effect that repairs you, builds you up, and makes you stronger. But if you're really stressed out and you have lots of health issues and your diet's poor and you don't cope with stress well and you don't have much energy, working out might be the straw that breaks the camel's back for you. It might just push you into that catabolic state that's going to ruin your physiology, that's going to give you all these symptoms. Um, so it really depends on where you are. Now the general thumb is if you have the energy to work out and you feel like you can do it and it's going to be good for you, then go and do it. But if you don't feel like you can work out, you don't feel like you have the energy, then do light forms of movement and just build energy in and feel like you're more energized. And you can do that until you feel like you can go and work out and it's not going to be this thing that's going to leave you sore for several days on end. I mean, if you ever go to the gym and you do a workout and it takes you over seven days to recover from your workout, you're probably in this fight or flight response mode where your stress um, hormones are up here and your sex hormones are down here and you've probably got a lot of symptoms as well. So you probably need to work out. Diet. Oh God, I could go on for hours on this one. Let's just give you some basic um, tools that you can implement straight away. Now, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach, unfortunately. I'm not going to tell you that you should eat a paleo diet. I'm not going to tell you it should be low-carb. I'm not going to tell you that you know a high-carbohydrate diet is good for you. Because it is and it isn't. It all depends. We're all uniquely individual on a biochemical level as we are of our thumbprint. Therefore, the ratios of fat, proteins, and carbohydrates is going to be completely different um, for each one of us here. And you have to really just more listen to your body and really fine tune your diet, find out what works best for you. Now, there's a way you can do that. You can simply either hire me as a health coach to teach you, or you can buy things like a glucometer, monitor your blood sugar, and you can use that to fine tune um, those ratios to suit your individual needs. Like an example of this would be, you wake up in the morning, you have a handful of strawberries, 40 minutes later you take your blood sugar, if your blood sugar is spiking through the roof, then you probably need some um, fats and protein to kind of bring it down to balance it out. Next again morning, take the same amount of strawberries, take some cottage cheese, put that on there, take your blood sugar again. Now, if your blood sugar is actually below normal, then you've had too much cottage cheese, too much fat and protein there. So on the third day, just take the same amount of strawberries, but less cottage cheese, and just do that until you really find that balance. And then that's going to be the perfect kind of ratio that you need when it comes to like carbohydrates and protein. And just learn to do what works best for you. Other things you can do with your diet, don't eat crap. 
Stop eating processed garbage because that's all it is, it's absolute crap. Don't give your money to these big food giants that are killing you. Eat organic food, eat biodynamic food, and support your local farmers. Go and buy food from like um, East Coast Dynamics, um, who else as well, Whitmore Farm and stuff like that. You know, give your money to support local farmers, support the people who are working hard for your health. And I'm really passionate about that one as well. And don't eat before you go to bed because you don't want your body to spend too much time um, digesting food because when you're sleeping you're actually repairing yourself and that's when all your repair and physiological processes happen is during sleep. So if you eat just before you go to bed you're going to waste so much energy just breaking down the food that you're not going to repair yourself neurologically or physically too much either. Am I going over time? I've got one minute to talk about rest and mindset and then we'll close up, okay? <laughs> rest, balance out your circadian rhythms, go to bed on time, try and get to bed between 10 and 11 o'clock max and get up in the morning about 6, 7 o'clock. This will help to balance out your stress hormones a wee bit more as well. We'll finish with rest there. Mindset. <laughs> Amanda gave you some excellent fit tips to do on your mindset. Now, how many of you, right, let, let's just see, hands up if you take 10 minutes a day to yourself. How many people take 10 minutes a day just to sit and do nothing and just be of their own thoughts? Excellent. Um, not too many people actually do this, but there's a couple of things you can do. If you're not the type of person that likes to just sit and meditate because you're quite fidgety and you have quite a lot of energy like me, you can do forms of like walking meditation. Go for a walk in the park and for every two steps you take, inhale. For the next two steps you take, exhale. And try and do that as slowly as you can and count each exhalation and count it up to 10 and if you find your mind wandering just bring it back, it's fine and just start at zero again and just do that for 10 minutes, that's another thing you can do but really, when we optimise these four areas here you're going to see that um, a lot of your symptoms will disappear because you're balancing out your physiology of the body you're starting to um, get s systems to work better so in closing it's, it's not about treating the symptom that has the person, it's more about treating the person that has the symptom. And when you balance this stuff out and you really figure it out and you implement it in your life, you're going to see huge changes in your health, your well-being. And again, it's just going to make you a better human being to be around. And it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about all of us here as well. And the healthier we become, the more we can help each other as well. And now if you want to know more about me, please check out my blog at coachfrasers.com that I've just put up as well. Uh, you can hire me as a health coach if you really want. If you have any questions, I will be free to speak to anybody during lunch as well, okay? Thank you very much.